Good morning, this is Todd Colburn of Cal Poly Pomona with the Aerospace Structure Series. Today I'm here with Lecture 18 of Aero 3271. And the topic is now crippling. Crippling is a very important topic for aerospace structures professionals and for anyone analyzing lightweight structures. Whenever we have a section constructing constructed of thin flanged members like T's, angles, J's, Z's, hats, and those kind of things, crippling is often the critical allowable. If the sample is long, it will tend to fail in Euler buckling. But if it is short, even very, very short, it will tend to be critical in crippling. Let's see how that works. So here are a few typical uh, cross sections that we might see in aerospace. Angles, Z's, hats, C channels, box sections, and so on. You'll notice all of these sections are consisted of uh, flanges, which are often uh, one to two inches long, maybe three quarters of an inch to two inches long. And a lot of these are relatively thin, maybe 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 0 0.063, up to about one-tenth of an inch or a bit more. These sections are critical in crippling if they're loaded in compression. If they're short or medium length, they will tend to cripple as these flanges waver out of the way under the action of the compressive forces. If the sample is relatively long, then buckling, Euler buckling, will be uh, dominant. And if it's somewhere in between, then the Euler buckling allowable will be affected by the crippling allowable. We'll learn how to do that in a few lectures. So today we're looking at crippling, and we're looking at what kind of things make these cripple. So let's take a look at a little angle section. You'll notice in figure A, we have a little angle loaded in compression. And in figure B, we see as we increase that load, what happens is first, those two angles start to, those two legs start to wiggle out of the way, right? You'll notice the stru structure doesn't buckle. Euler buckling means it would buckle like this, right? But when we have crippling, even if it's really short, what we see are the flanges of the element will buckle out of the way. The overall section hasn't bowed, but the flanges begin to bow. You see that starting in figure B. If you keep on loading it, what happens is that flange will double back along itself. You'll know it, is, it acts like a pin support on the heel of the angle, but that free edge tends to bow and eventually will crinkle back on itself. We see a similar failure mode when you step on a Coke can that's empty. You see how it crinkles back and forth and crushes under a relatively constant load. Well, that is the mechanism of crippling. Whenever we have a thin flange member, we'll see those flanges will bow like that. Now, we've kind of seen this already because we looked at plate buckling, right? When we had a plate which had supports not only on the ends but on the edges, then we got our plate buckling co uh, formulas. The same thing is true here. You see this angle is actually two plates loaded up with uh, supports on three sides, the two ends and the edge. And that uh, limits, it gives it some strength for, for compression, but it actually uh, buckles in those flanges. And that's what we call crippling. If we idealize our section, we see that idea. Here we see that this, these, this little angle can be idealized as two plates with three simple supports on each flange and one free edge on each flange. You see that? If we took the buckling allowable of each of these flanges independently and then put them together by taking, say, a weighted average, then we would get something that's analogous to the crippling allowable. Now we're going to look at three methods for crippling, and but first we're going to look at plate buckling. What we learned about plate buckling, and we're going to lay the foundation for crippling using that. 
First, let's take a quick look at nomenclature that we might use for this. Let's go back to our little angle and we see that if we have an angle, we're going to need the dimensions of that angle. And since we're focused on the flange effects, we're going to need to know what the lengths and the thicknesses are for each and every flange. Now, when we do that, if we take a look at this section, we see, let's say, uh, a lot of times an angle will be called out. It will be identified as the overall length of each flange. But what we're going to do, you'll notice that, that a flange like this doesn't buckle from here to here. It tends to buckle from the mid-plane of the adjacent flange. That's what we see here. We see this flange, and often we'll call it the B's. B meaning the dimension that's the length of the flange, and T for the thickness. But to make it a little clearer, since we have two different flanges, each of which might have a dimension B, we'll call it dimension A and dimension B for the lengths of the two flanges with the thickness. This particular section has the same thickness for both, and we'll see that the pertinent dimensions that we need are that distance from the free edge to the mid-plane of the adjacent flange. You see how A goes to the mid-plane of B's flange, and B goes to the mid-plane of A's flange? That's how we're going to find those lengths. We're going to use that with the thicknesses. In this case, both thicknesses are the same. In some cases, they'll be different. We'll show you how that works as we go. Are you with me? Okay, one more idea before we move forward, and that's this corner stiffening effect. So we're talking about crippling, crippling being a compression failure, and one that happens when sections are even very short. It's not only valid where sections are short. Actually, crippling, once you have that crippling allowable, the same crippling allowable is valid regardless of length. However, if you get very long, then other compression stability problems like Euler's buckling will tend to dominate instead, become more dominant, and that's why we won't look at crippling when it gets relatively long sometimes. Now what we've looked at so far, we talked about that buckling of each little panel, looking at each flange and treating it as a panel with edge constraints, and that's true. However, there's another effect. These panels are also sitting on this angle. This angle is kind of like a little stiffer column than the panel itself. So the angle increases the crippling allowable beyond just its, its panel value. Or it actually will sustain that, that angle, that flange, buckling up to a certain level. So what we end up seeing is those uh, the compression strength of the member tends to be also a function of how those angle corners are uh, laid out. So you can kind of see here with this little stress distribution along there that in the middle of the panel where the thing is less stable, you'll end up carrying less stress. And near the corners where you've got all the stiffness of that bend, you'll tend to carry more stress. You get a nonlinear stress distribution, which we're going to mostly ignore and just use a simplified approach to evaluate. Are you with me? So these are some basic ideas. And that, oh, for this reason, Crippling is generally called an edge, a corner effect, a corner stiffness effect because of the stiffening nature of these corners, okay? So with those ideas in mind, let's go and lay the groundwork. And, and what we're going to do, once again, is we're going to go back to what we learned about panel buckling. Remember, a panel is anything loaded in compression when you have supports on three or more sides. If there's only supports on the two ends, then that's more like an Euler column. If there's constraints on three or more sides, then we generally idealize that as a plate, okay? So with that idea, let's go to that analysis. So if we just take a look, let's just go back, say, okay, a wing may have a bunch of stringers. These often would be T's or hat sections or J's or Z's, or they might even be angles like this particular member. Let's just say that our, ang our wing has these angle sections. And if we wanted to evaluate this, we would apply, we could start, if we knew nothing about crippling, we could start by applying what we know about panel buckling, okay? So once again, this is not a recognized crippling method that I'm talking about right now. What I'm doing is going back to what we know about panel buckling, evaluating that cross section using what we know there, and what we're gonna find out is this gives insight into the way crippling actually works, okay?
So with this idea, we could go back and we would take the panel buckling allowable, which looks like this. And since our cross section is an angle with dimensions like this, we've got lengths and thicknesses. Once again, we've identified our section as the distance from the free edge to the uh, far side of the next flange and so on. This is often how these parts will be identified, but in order to do crippling allow, uh, analysis, we're going to evaluate, we're going to change these B1 and B2 into the effective lengths of each flange, which will only go from the free edge to the mid plane of the adjacent flange like we talked about last slide. So we can look at the force in each. The force in each of these flanges is just the crippling uh, or the buckling level of each of these times its area, okay? And the total force carried by this section is just the summation of the total force that each flange carries, fine. The corresponding stress is simply P over A, which we can write this way, which we can write this way, which we can write this way. The sum of the F criticals, BTs, or the sum of the BTs. The sum of the BTs is just disguised as the area of the thing. And the sum of the buckling allowables times the BT is just the stress allowable of each flange times its area. This gives you a weighted average allowable by taking the compressive strength of each flange and summing them up. So it's basically a weighted average of the compressive allowable. And right now we're talking about panel buckling, looking at each flange as a panel, right? So if this is our idealization, we can idealize this with two flanges. Once again, each flange is going just to the mid plane of the adjacent flange. You'll see that one, B2, also just goes to the mid plane of the adjacent flange. So our effective lengths of each of these, since these have the same lengths, can be written as the original B1 minus half that thickness, right? And if we went to, say, our allowable, our compressive allowable, we see this. In this particular case, what we have is a panel. We can pretend that each end of the thing, the flanges are simply supported, and along the fold of the member it's simply supported. That gives us three edges simply supported with one free edge. That's case E. That uh, we see here in this figure that actually that value is about 0 0.43. It's our coefficient, buckling coefficient is 0.43 if our length of the thing is about three-ish inches or greater. Actually, uh, it's actually not much different than that if it's even shorter. How many of our cross sections are longer than, uh, let's see, three inches is that long? How many cross sections do we have that are shorter than that? Not many. So what this means is pretty much any section we see, whether it's three inches or more, will have this allowable. Okay? And so we can calculate the buckling allowable of each flange and then if we go and we plug that into our weighted average formula, we find out it'll be the same value since each of these have the same value, about 11 KSI for this member, which is a pretty common number for typical aerospace sections. Okay? So actually, if we wanted to take this further, if uh, this is our section and this is our allowable and this is true... We could say, okay, so this was assuming that the uh, edges and the fold were all simple supports. What if we had a different support? What if we have a clamped condition? Then we go to the chart D, the same figure, but now we're on case D, and we see that our allowable or our buckling coefficient has jumped from 0.3 to 1.28. That's much higher. So actually, if this thing were actually clamped, it would have a much higher buckling allowable. However, uh, a lot of these, if, if uh, since these thin sections are often attached to thin sections, usually something closer to a simple support is more appropriate. Now, if we wanted to, we could go to uh, this other figure that shows percent fixity, where we have a free edge down here at 0.43, 
uh, when you have three simple supports and a one edge that's got a partial fixity, like a free edge would be 0.43, and it's, if it's clamped on that extra edge, it's 1.28. So we get all these different curves. We could actually use whichever coefficient is appropriate between those two values. So if we said, okay, actually we've got a thick member or maybe it's a machined member rather than a bent up sheet member it has a little higher stiffness now we're actually not going to do this but what this shows is that, that there's actually a range of values somewhere between between using a coefficient of 0.43 and using a coefficient of 1.28 that actually gives us a good estimate of what a angle section could be good for okay now we could use the same approach, which actually is based on plate buckling for all crippling analysis, but nobody's doing that. I'm presenting this here to help provide understanding of how this actually works. And my students in Arrow 3271 are going to have a homework problem or two where they actually have to estimate the crippling allowable based on plate buckling using this approach right here. However, this is just to drive understanding. This is not the way it's done in industry. We're going to use these three methods that I'm going to provide next in order to estimate the crippling allowable. You're going to find that it's even easier when you use these three methods. So let's think about this a little more and then we'll jump into that as follows. So we saw that when we have a column any kind of cross-section that is consists, whenever it has thin flanged members like we saw, if it's relatively long, we already know that Euler buckling may be in effect. As it gets shorter and shorter, then flange buckling becomes probably more critical. Okay? As those flanges begin to buckle, then the adjacent angles uh, where the corners are tends to take more load and what we're going to do is come up with a crippling allowable this is called crippling it's called a local buckle fail ba buckling failure because those flanges are what's buckling not the overall section as a whole but each flange individually it becomes unable to sustain the load this is what we call crippling or local buckling and it is called a corner effect. Okay? All right, so we're going to present three methods for evaluating this. Four when you account that for that plate buckling method that I just applied, but we're not going to use that in industry. That's just to drive understanding. Okay? Let's start by looking at the Needham method. The Needham method was developed in the uh, a few decades ago under the war effort by the government. Uh, by a guy named Needham, and basically what he did is he postulated, because of that corner effect, he postulated that basically the crippling allowable is proportional to the strength of each angle in the section. So if you have a single angle, his method is pretty straightforward. If you have a member constructed of a number of angle-like sections, then we will evaluate the crippling allowable of each of those sections and then combine them using a weighted average. Okay, so let's see how that works. For example, if we have a single angle, once again, we're going to define the nomenclature as the lengths going from the free edge to the midplane of the adjacent flange and the thickness of each. If we have a single angle like we see in figure A, then we can apply his method directly. If we have a C channel like we see in figure B, what we're going to do is break it up into two angles and then evaluate the crippling allowable of each and then combine those allowables. If we have a square channel, then we will cut it up in our minds to break it into four separate angles, which then we calculate the allowable of each of those angles and then we combine them using a weighted average. This is his approach and stay tuned to see how it works. So to look at our nomenclature further, what we're going to do first is cut our member up into a series of angles. Then we're going to need to define the nomenclature. So if we have an angle dimension like we see in figure A with dimensions A, B, thickness of A, and thickness of B, then we're going to turn that in to 
effective flange lengths, A prime and B prime, which go from the free edge to that midplane value, free edge to that midplane value. And then we're going to define the parameter B over T. Now, if the flanges are the same length, and if the thicknesses are the same thickness, then actually you can just take one flange length B divided by one flange thickness T, and that's the B over T parameter. However, if these flanges are different lengths, or if they have different thicknesses, you can use this equation here, which will give you the effective B over T ratio. Once again, whether you use the B over T or the B over T effective, our, the value we need is that end to midplane value. That's what we're looking for, as you can see in this formula. It's called B over T effective, but it's really that a prime and the B prime, which goes from free edge to midplane, free edge to midplane, divided by its corresponding thickness over two, that gives you the effect of B over T ratio. You got that? Okay. With that in mind, this B over T effective parameter, we're ready to move forward in our derivation. We'll next look next at the edge constraint. What we're going to do is look at each angle and figure out and identify what is the edge constraint of that angle. When we talk about edge constraint, what we mean is how are the edges of each flange constrained? For example, if we have this angle here in figure A, we see that our first flange, flange A, has a, uh, oh, what we're looking at. Uh, with Needham's method, we're not looking at it flange by flange. What we're looking at it is angle by angle. So if we look at this figure A, that's a single angle. We see that this edge of the angle is free, and this edge of the angle is free. So that's a two-edge free angle. We have one angle, and both its edges are free. If we had a C channel like we see in B, then we're going to analyze two angles. And each of those has one free edge and one non-free edge, or one fixed edge. So we'll call it one edge free, because this edge is free, and this edge actually is continuous. And this one also is one edge free, because one edge is free and one edge is continuous. If we have the square channel, we're going to break it up into four angles. We've got to cut it four times to break it into four angles. And each of those has no edges free, because both legs of the angles of each angle are continuous. It's not the end of the part of free. It's not a free edge. So that would be no edge free. So we're going to look at our... Now this is for an angle, a C channel, and a square channel. But actually there are a bunch of other sections, Z's and J's and all kinds of other things where we can do the same process and identify first break it up into angles and then identify whether it's a two edge free, one edge free, or no edge free because that will define our buckling coefficient. Once we have that coefficient, we then plug into the equation. We're going to analyze a crippling allowable for each and every angle. So if we have a single angle like we see in figure A, then we will apply this equation once. That was uh, two edges free, so our CE coefficient is 0.316. We take our FCY of the material, our compressive modulus of the material, and our effective B over T ratio, which is computed like we saw on the last slide. And we calculate the allowable. Since that's a single angle, then that will be the allowable of the section. Now, if we had this C channel and we broke it up in two angles, then that means we're going to analyze, use this equation twice. Now, if this section is symmetric, we only need to use it once and recognize it happens two times. Same thing with section C. We would use that four times unless they're all the same, in which case we use it once. Okay. Once we have the crippling allowable of each angle in the section, we then calculate the total crippling allowable of the entire section by taking the summation of the FCCs times BTs over the sum of the BTs. Now, once again, now we saw before we looked at panel buckling, we called it F critical, FCR, for that critical buckling stability strength. When we're talking about crippling, while this is a buckling phenomena, we typically, it's common to use the nomenclature FCC instead of FCR. So whenever you see FCC, that is a crippling allowable. It means it's for that crippling failure mode.
So this equation here for FCC just gives you the weighted average of the crippling allowables. Once again, in our three examples above, we have a single angle, two angles, and three and four angles, right? If the sections that B and C are both symmetric, then you really only calculate one crippling allowable, and actually the weighted average will be exactly the same as what the single angle value was. But if your flanges are not the same length, your A and B are not the same length, and if the thickness of the flanges are different, then you may have as many as one of these values for each and every angle, and then you will have to use this equation in order to calculate the crippling allowable of the entire section. Okay? That's how it works. Now, whenever we see sections like one of these, these are the kind of sections it looks like. If we look at these sections, we see first we have an angle. We know Needham's method works for an angle. We just saw that that's what it's defined for. We would use this equation, FCC equation, one time, and that would give us the allowable of the cross section. This section section that we see here is actually uh, the second section we see could be, if we would break it up here, we see that gives us two angles. This angle, one and two. Each of these angles is one edge free. Therefore, we'd use this equation twice and then put into the summation equation. For this one here, we would cut it here and here. We see three angles. We'd use this equation up here three times to evaluate our crimping allowable. For this next one, we would cut it here and here and here and here and here, we see we have one, two, three, four, five, six different times we apply this equation, and then we take each of those and plug them into this. With this last section, we cut it once, we get two angles, we apply this equation twice, and this once to get our crippling allowable. Okay? All right. Now, if we instead If we look at these sections here, we say, okay, let's use this great method for these sections. Let's try it on a T. How can you cut that T so it's in angles? Can you cut the I so it's in angles? How about the J? You're going to end up with a T section. How about the Y? I don't know how to cut it in angles, and neither does Needham. So Needham's method will work for this first set of pieces, anything that can be cut into, into angles, but it will not work for anything that you can't cut into angles. Therefore, we need another method. So while Needham's method is relatively simple, it is limited in what it will apply to. Okay? So that summarizes Needham's method. Let's take a look at Girard's method. Girard's method takes a completely different approach. He uses a bunch of test data and he comes up with three equations to approximate the crippling allowable for the entire section. The way he does this is he introduces a parameter that he calls G, the flange cut parameter, which basically is a summation of the number of flanges to cut up the members and the number of, uh, excuse me, the number of cuts that you need to make to break it into certain basic shapes and then the number of flanges after the cuts, okay? So let's take a look at how this works and let's start by defining our nomenclature. So Girard's nomenclature, FCC once again is the crippling allowable, FCY is the compressive yield strength, the compressive modulus we're gonna use, we're gonna need the thickness, we're gonna need the area of the section for some of the equations, and we're gonna need this G parameter. So let's look further at this G parameter. This is actually the hardest part of Girard's method and the place where people mess up the most, that and selecting the appropriate equation. Okay, so what Girard suggests is he says, look, there are some basic shapes. An angle is a basic shape. That's what Needham used. He, a T is a basic shape. A crucifix or a cross is a basic shape. And based on that, we're gonna cut up the members. Remember with Needham, we cut it up into a bunch of angles. With Girard, you're going to cut it up to, into one of these into multiples of, of some of these basic shapes until it's broken into these basic shapes. 
You're going to cut it until you have angles, T's, or crucifixes. Once you have cut it, you count the number of cuts, and then you count the number of flanges. The one exception is this plate. If you have a single plate that's fixed on both edges, he defines that as three cuts, as you see it lower left here, okay? You can kind of see his approach in action here with his eye section. You see we have a single cut, which breaks that eye section into two T's. Therefore, we have one cut, and we have three flanges for each T, which means we have a total of seven for our G. In that box section, you see we would need four cuts. That breaks it up into four angles. Therefore, we have four cuts. Each angle has two flanges, so that's eight flanges total for a total of 12 is the G. That's how we calculate G. You're going to sketch the member, cut it until you get into these basic shapes, and then add the number of cuts to the number of flanges. Okay, we'll see how that works further. Once you have that G parameter, we then are ready to go and choose an equation. So once again, as I said, Gerard gives us three equations, okay? And the, uh, the hardest part of Gerard is getting the parameter G correct, although the way I just described it I think is pretty clear, okay? The second hardest part is picking which of these silly equations applies. What I'm going to propose is a systematic method that will remove the wonder of that evaluation. We're going to look at our cross-section and identify, is it a Z, is it a J, or is it a C? If it is any of those three, we'll use this first equation. If you use the first equation, you're going to need to calculate the total area of the cross-section. That goes in here. The thickness of the cross-section, that goes in here. The compressive modulus, the yield strength, FCY and you have your crippling allowable. Now, if it is not a Z or J over C, then you're going to look and say, well, is this a flat plate? Is this an I section or an H section? H is just an I on its side, right? Or a T section. If it's one of those, then you apply the second equation. Once again, we're going to need the thickness, the area, the compressive modulus, the yield strength, but we're also going to need the G for this equation. You'll notice we didn't need G on the first equation, but now we need G. So once again, we're going to take that I, H, or T. We're going to break it up into those pieces. Now, if we actually have an I, we already know that that's one cut, six flanges. That's going to be a G of seven. An H will be the exact same thing. A T is already a basic shape, so that has no cuts, three flanges. That's a G of three. So for this equation, we're going to either have a G of 7, 7, or 3. Pretty simple. Okay. Now, for Gerard's method, if neither of those two equations apply, if it's not a Z, J, or C, a plate, an I, H, or T, then it is either an angle, a V groove, or some other section. For all other sections besides that first seven sections... We're going to use this third equation. This third equation requires you to calculate the area of the part of the cross section, great, E sub C, F C Y, thickness, and G. How do we get G? You're going to have to systematically cut it until it's in one of the basic shapes, a collection of basic shapes, add the number of cuts to the number of flanges, and that's your G. That's how it works, okay? Now, once you get a little bit euphoric that this is so uh, simple with this straightforward approach, and you start trying to implement it, you start running into problems. For example, if you have a cross-section that has different thicknesses, then what thickness to use here? You could just use the average thickness, but that won't really be right. Or you can use like a weighted average thickness. That's probably as good as it gets. So if you use a weighted average thickness, this is a way to calculate the weighted average thickness. Sum the Bs, the lengths, or remember that's free edge to the midplane of each flange times its thickness and divide by that by the sum of the Bs and that will give you 
an effective T that you could plug in for your T value. Now the problem is if you have uh, multiple thicknesses, sometimes that will mean that each some flanges will have different allowables even if they're of the same material. So if you have different materials in the different flanges, then you can account for it with the same kind of weighted average equation. And here's your equations. Here's how you can estimate an effective FCY and effective modulus. Okay, you got that? That's how that works. Okay, so this is Girard's method and it will work for everything if you systematically apply it in this way. Now it's actually valid whenever you have one of these sections that we're talking about that are roughly the dimensions of uh, what they tested. If it's very, if your cross section is very different than what they tested, then this method may, may differ more, okay? Uh, you'll notice the hardest part of this is that determining which cuts to make and computing your G parameter, okay? So uh, let's look at another method, a third method. This is Anderson's method, and uh, while I, uh, this method, while it's not nearly as well known in industry, this method is quite similar to what they use in a number of aerospace companies, okay? Basically, his method is quite similar to, uh, it's kind of similar to Needham, it's kind of similar to Gerard, and here's how it is. Basically, where Needham broke up the section by idealizing it into a number of angles, Anderson breaks it up into a series of flanges. And then he categorizes that flanges. Remember, our Needham method categorized those angles by end constraint, and Anderson is going to do something similar. Okay? So he's going to idealize this section flange by flange, and he's going to use an equation based on the edge constraint. And it's going to average up the total allowable in the same weighted way that we did before. So let's look further. We're going to get three equations, okay? So we're, once again, we're going to look at this cross section and we're going to look at each and every flange. We're going to take the width of that flange from the edge to the midplane of the adjacent flange and we're going to come up with the thickness over that length ratio. Since this is for a flange by itself, then it's each flange, it doesn't matter if they have the same thickness or different thicknesses, this will account for it. So for every flange that has no edges free, what does no edge free? That means the section that that flange is attached to something at both ends. If a flange is attached to something at both ends, then use this first equation. You take the thickness over the length ratio, where that length is midplane of adjacent flange to midplane of adjacent flange, and you plug and chug, and then you have the allowable for that flange. If you come up to a flange that has one edge free, like at, if you have an angle, then you've got two, two flanges, each of them have one edge free, okay? And in that one edge free condition, an angle the, the non-free edge is attached to only a single flange. Therefore, this equation would apply to each flange in an angle section, right? Okay. If you have a, a section and it's got one edge free, but if the non-free edge is applied to two flanges rather than just one, two or more, then you use the third equation. And the third equation... Uh, gives you how to estimate that. Once you have the crimping allowable for each and every flange, you then plug in to this weighted average formula where you take the FCC of each flange times its length and thickness divide by the summation of all B's and T's and that gives you the crippling allowable of the section. Okay? So let's take a look at how that looks. For example, uh, let's see, Needham, this little example problem to the left, lower left, Needham wouldn't work because there are pieces, you can't divide that up into only angles. Now you could use Girard with that last equation, but calculating G will be a challenge. 
If you look at this thing and apply Anderson's method, then it's basically flange by flange. You see this first flange here. Let's go ahead and draw on this. We see this is our first flange, and it is one edge free, and it only has one adjacent edge at the non-free edge. So that is our second equation. This next one is no edge free, so that's our first equation. Our next one is one edge free, but it has two adjacent edges, so that's our third equation. This next one has no edges free, that's our first equation. This one over here, no edges free, that's our first equation. This is one edge free with a single adjacent flange, that's our second equation. This one is no edges free, that's our first equation. This one is one edge free with two adjacent edges, so that's our third equation. Edge, uh, equation. This one has no edges free, that's our first equation. This one has one edge free with a single adjacent flange, so that's our second equation. You would calculate one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's check that again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, ten crippling allowables. You then plug into this sum of the FCC. So you take the FCC of the first flange times its length from the free edge to the midplane of the adjacent flange times its thickness plus the FCC of number two times its length times its thickness plus FCC of three times its length, times its thickness, plus four, times its length, times a plus, and so on. Divide it by the total summation of the BTs, which actually is just the area of the total member, and that gives you the weighted average crippling allowable for the whole cross-section. That's how this method works. Does that make sense? Curiously, I have never run into Anderson's method out there in industry. However, it's very similar to the methods that are in the MD11, the DC10 stress manual, the MDAC stress manual, and many other stress manuals of various companies that I have run across. This method is beautiful. The beauty of it is it's really simple. You can evaluate each and every flange on its own merit and then sum up the contributions of each to get a crippling allowable that's valid. This is probably the best of those methods. All of them you're going to uh, notice when you start calculating crippling allowables using all these different equations, you're going to find out you get differing answers. They're similar. Sometimes one will be a higher, sometimes another will be a little higher. But this one, I believe, does the best job of accounting for each and every flange on its own merit and combining its contribution. It's simple, it's direct, and it's effective for evaluating uh, crippling allowables. Okay, So that's our three methods. We actually have four methods, one of which is not really a crippling method, it's just providing some background. That's that panel buckling equation uh, approach, which my students will learn to use, but industry professionals just can read for their leisure. Then we have those three methods. If you use Needhammer or Girard, people will understand what you're doing. It's for those are very commonly used. If you use Anderson, that's less well known, but actually it's very direct and appropriate. Okay, so let's deal with a couple other nuances here as we now try and really let this knowledge sink in. This is a list of potential cutoffs. Uh, Brune estimates these. He uh, suggests that we should cut off FCC at the at either FCY or at some fraction of that. Uh, I'm actually not sure where he got this idea. I think this is out of uh, one of Gerard or Becker's papers. I need to look into that further. But basically what he proposes is don't let your FCC get too high. Now, I actually kind of agree, disagree with this approach because it's a little too simple and it's a little too conservative for someone that wants to design efficient aircraft that really do the best job of meeting requirements. However, 
Once you get above FCY, remember, you start to go on the stress strain curve, you start getting into the tangent modulus, your modulus starts to drop rapidly. And whenever we calculate crippling, we're always using the compression modulus. So we get up there where our stresses are nonlinear and the modulus is dropped, our crippling model we calculate really isn't that valid. And therefore, this is a like a poor man's approach to estimating and making sure that the crippling level doesn't become unconservative. Now, we're not going to use this in Arrow 3271. I just want my students to be aware that because uh, actually I've uh, seen a lot of analysis that doesn't use these cutoffs out there in industry. Um, and uh, so my students aren't going to use this. However, we should be aware that these cutoffs exist. And um, if you're asked to use it, you should be able to use it. But we're not going to use it unless asked. Industry professionals should use this to make themselves suspicious of their own work. If they get a crippling allowable that is above these cutoffs, probably you want to stick with these cutoffs unless you do more analysis and verify that a higher crippling allowable is actually valid. And that analysis would probably include accounting for some of that uh, reduction in the modulus. Okay. One other idea. Okay, now when we think back to what we've seen, especially when we started with our panel buckling approach, we saw that edge constraint of each flange makes a difference of crippling allowable. The better the edge constraint, the higher the crippling allowable. Now what we can do instead of adding a whole flange, we can just put a little lip. If we bend up the end of a flange and then suddenly the adjacent flange becomes no edge free, that's going to increase our crippling allowable. Or if you put a little bulb on that thing, as you see here, that will tend to create, increase our allowable. But the question arises, well, how much bulb or lip do you need in order to give enough restraint that it actually has a positive effect? So uh, I think some of Wagner's work or uh, Gerard's work may have developed this, but Brune lays out a couple criteria for evaluating whether this flange is sufficient. So if we use this nomenclature here, we're going to define the length and thickness of the flange and the length and thickness of the lip as shown here. Then he provides a couple criteria in which we can be summarized with a single equation where we take the length of the lip, and once again, these are end to mid-plane distances. Uh, if we take that ratio and compare it to the flange ratio, then if we meet this criterion, then that lip is sufficient to provide enough restraint and we can idealize the adjacent flange, in this particular case, as no edge free. If we fail this criteria, then we treat that flange as being having a free edge. Okay, That's how it works. So this we evaluate this. Now, uh, if let's say that it, our check, let's say we fail this check. So what do we do then? If we fail this check, what we could do is we could say, well, gee, if I am not good for this check, then I can just take the total length as this plus this and pretend that that whole flange is rotated out so the flange is about that long, right? Now it's BF plus BL long with one free edge. That's going to greatly reduce your crippling allowable. And in my con, uh, opinion, that's a really conservative approach. But that is one way to make sure that we're not unconservative with our analysis. Okay? So that's how that works. Now if we get a bulb, we can use this exact same criteria but actually, what we need to do first is come up with the effective B and the effective T for that lip or bulb. So you can use this little equation here that I developed. This gives you an approximate B and T for a bulb that you can now plug into this first equation and evaluate whether that bulb is sufficient to provide the kind of restraint that you think. In this case, if it fails that criterion, you can just take BF as being the distance from this pin down here to the very extreme length edge of the flange and do your analysis. And that would be a conservative way to evaluate that. Okay.
Now in arrow 3271, we're actually going to always, if we see a flange, we're going to just treat it as a different flange and not evaluate whether it's effective, unless asked to evaluate whether or not it's effective. If you're asked to evaluate whether or not it's effective, then you will check this criterion, and if it passes this criterion, then you can treat that lip as a separate flange, and if it doesn't pass this criterion, then you can just assume that that whole length of the adjacent flange and lip is just one flange, and assess single crippling allowable for that. Okay, so let's uh, just think about some ideas here. If we take a look at these sections, if we have an angle, we know that Needham works for angles. We know that Girard works for angles, and we know Anderson works for angles. In Needham's method, we apply his equation once. Girard's method, we use the angle equation. In uh, Anderson's method, we would take. Uh, we analyze each of these two flanges and put those allowables together. We can see that, that uh, all three methods will also evaluate a Z or a lipped Z, a hat, a channel, and many other sections. However, if we have a cross section that looks like any of these, we already saw that Needham's method won't work. Girard's method will work, and Anderson's method will work. Gerard's method is pretty straightforward if you have a T, an I, or a J. But if you get a Y or something more complicated, it can be challenging to implement. Regardless, Anderson's method is probably the most straightforward to apply to these. If you get a cross-section like this puppy, we already saw that that could be either Gerard or Anderson. In Gerard, you would need, what, one, two, three, four four, five cuts, and then you would have to count flanges to calculate your G, and then you'd plug into the appropriate formula. In my opinion, Anderson's is the easiest way to use to apply to something like this. Okay, that's all I got for you. Enjoy.